Well, that was decidedly ordinary. I'll just try that again. Good afternoon. Thank you. That was remarkably better. And I guess let me just ask the first question, if I can, please, just by way of interest. How many people have had a fair bit of trouble going to sleep the last few nights because you've just been so excited about the fact that you got to be at this conference with me as the closing speaker today? Just a show of hands would do perfectly. Thanks. No, that's great. I just bought a couple of books to give away. So I just want to say thanks to those couple of people, if I can. Uh, there was a lady here. Is that true for you? Okay, let me just ask the next question because this might be easier. Who found that you've been going to sleep okay but this morning you woke up early with excitement and anticipation? Who was in that space? Great, thank you. There's obviously no integrity in the second response. I understand how that works. So let me just ask the honest question so we can do some work. Um, who really doesn't give a rat so I am? You just want a free book. Where are those people? Excellent. No, good. I was just checking. Thanks for the feedback. Um, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about you, I guess. And I want to talk about you, not just when you first turned up to work. Who remembers when you first turned up to work as an employee, you were nice? Who remembers being nice at your job interview, regardless of what role you have? Uh, how many people here have also had a first date? Has anyone been out with one person at least once? Who's had that experience as well? Whether it was a job interview or at the first date, you were amazing, I suspect. How many people remember being patient, helpful, kind, forgiving, thoughtful, humorous, problem solving, curious? Who remembers being that, seriously? And then something happens in three months. In three months, something changes. Some other person turns up in your organisation. Some other person turns up in your relationship. And I guess, what do you do with those people? The first time I left my own businesses... I've got about 500 employees that I get to work with in a few different companies in different states that I have a vested interest in. And I have to tell you that every single person that we've employed when they first came up were just amazing people. Everything was amazing. And when I left my own self-employment and went thinking, hmm, could I talk to other companies about their own culture, their own effectiveness, their own employee engagement? I got invited to speak to a person who had opened a new factory with the most cutting edge technology that you could imagine. This is in 1993 and he invited me in to come and speak to him because he said, I want someone to come and motivate my staff. And in the conversation I discovered that they were working with this cutting edge technology, that all of the employees had been there just 11 months. And after talking to him for about 10 minutes, I said, look, I don't think it's about me coming and motivating your staff. In fact, were they excited and enthusiastic and positive when they first joined the organisation? He said, well, of course they were. I said, I'd rather talk to you about what you did to them in the last 11 months because I think that's probably going to be a better conversation than me coming along and motivating them because I can't motivate anybody. And it was an interesting conversation and I didn't get the work initially because he just wanted to put a little Band-Aid on it and not address some of the real issues. And I think part of the conversation for you and I as business owners, business managers, people that manage a group of people, is that if we're getting a really good outcome with those people, it's probably our fault. So I'm going to invite you to do something that usually elicits a whinging, moaning, complaining noise. So could you please make that noise now to get it out of the way? Go. Perfect. And here's the invitation. In a moment, I'm inviting you to leave the safety of your seat temporarily. I'm inviting you to find someone in the room that fits a particular criteria. It's not just a random grab for another human being. I'd like you to be cognizant of four criteria, please. And the four criteria that I'm inviting you to satisfy, please, is that you are going to start a relationship with someone in the room, please, that is A, not sitting either side of you. Someone B, who is least known to you. Someone C, who you regard as energetic and intelligent looking. And if you're a little anxious about criteria C, let me give you criteria D, which isn't really criteria, it's basically advice. Uh, the good ones will go quick. So my <laughs> advice to you is not to be one of the people stuffing around, otherwise that could be a little awkward for you. So for the very structured, organised learners, are there any list writers here, please? Any people here that like to write lists? Thank you. Any people here that like to write lists? And if you do something that's not on your list, you write it in and then tick it off to say you did it. Who goes to that level of detail? So let me just revisit the criteria. You're not taking anything with you. You're going to take some information with you in your head, and that's what I'm curious about. And you're going to start a relationship with someone in the room who is A, not sitting either side of you, B, least known to you, C, energetic and intelligent looking. And just a tip on that. If you are, as you're making your way up and down aisles looking for people in this space, 
And you're getting this sense that you're inside people's space, but even inside that space, they still flick away from you and, 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 and kind of move on to the next person. And you're going back to the abandonment. You're having some amygdala hijacking, so you're back at your youth. Who remembers being at school and they were picking teams? And there was only two kids left, and even just with two kids left, the team captains would still go, hmm, what do you reckon? So before you go back and have some amygdala hijacking, can I suggest, if you're getting a sense that you are being inadvertently overlooked, my encouragement, please, is to put your hand up. Keep it up so you can find someone else that has been inadvertently overlooked, and you'll at least be able to satisfy the first two criteria. So please take nothing with you. Stand, find yourself someone who fits that criteria. Ladies and gentlemen, please, clap, clap your hands once if you can hear me. Go. Clap your hands twice if you can hear me, please. Go. Great. Thank you. Here's what I'm inviting you to do. I'm inviting you shortly to share some deeply personal information with your partner. And when I say deeply personal, you do not have to go, I've got this rash, it won't go away here. I've been asking, <laughs> I want to see the surgeon. Um, so it doesn't have to go to that level, but I'm asking you, please, to answer a question. And for there to be some structure, I'd like a person A and a person B and a C where applicable, where people are just joining the group. So pick a person A and a person B, decide who's who. That's like A, B, do the head nod thing, person. Great, person A, put up your hands. Person B, put up your hands. Good, person B, you're going to go first. <laughs> and what I'm curious about person B is this. We use a lot of creative KPIs in our business that relate directly to our management team, not to our HR team. We love our HR team, but they're not in charge of the culture in our business. Our management team is in charge of the culture in our business. And how many people have had people in your own management team that you were glad to see the back of? Has anyone had one of those things, seriously? Um, in simple terms, who's been to a farewell morning tea and you know what was being said about the person leaving was not true? Because <laughs> pretty much it's the same speech every single time. People get up and go, oh, we're really going to miss Bruce. Bruce is going to leave a real hole in our team. And if it's true, it's true. And if it's not true, people are down the back going, oh, <laughs> arsehole. <laughs> Seriously, how many people in your career have only ever gone to a farewell morning tea because you could smell sausage rolls coming from a staff room? Has anyone been to one of those things? And so one of the creative KPIs we use with our managers is how many people are going out of their way right now to help you have a better day at work and at home? And in terms of engagement, how engaged am I with you? How much do I even know about you as my leader, what you need? what your requirements are, what your expectations are. So it is coming even the other way. I know you like that document on your desk at Tuesday a.m. before midday because you need to do the board report. That's got to be ready by Wednesday. You always want that last piece of information, so I make sure it's on your desk because that's... I just can't help but offer you that reciprocity. I'm going out of my way to help you as my leader, as my boss. If you were on fire down at Woolworths, just say and all of your staff were standing around you in the car park with the fire extinguisher, how many would actually put you out and how many people would be just going, oh, quick, go and get some more fuel, okay, and like start doing that. Like, what's going on in that space? So here's the conversation, person B. I want you to do two numbers in your head. As managers of people, I want you to think about the number of people that you lead and manage. And as it's been explained to me, we've got people here that run their own private practices right through to bigger hospitals, to day surgeries, and you will have different responsibilities where you fit into that. It was interesting earlier to see that we didn't have any patients here. I thought that was interesting too. So I'm going to ask you, please, person B, how many people and what payroll do you have? Two numbers. You might have 20 people, you might have 10, you may have all the people that fit into the bottom end of your revenue statement in terms of wages, contractors, etc. And person B, what are you going to do? You're going to do some bragging rights as a senior leader in your business and you're going to brag to person A about what you purposefully did in the last seven days to get your $5 million worth, to get your $20 million worth. Because I have to tell you as a business person, when I look at the bottom end of my revenue statement, I rock a little bit. And I see the wages, contractors, bill. Has, how, how many people have ever wondered, does all that money come in every week to pay it out again? Has anyone ever had that little moment? And you sit quietly and you look at that data and you're going, really? We, is that, that's the wages this week? Okay. <laughs> um, who would agree alcohol helps at that particular point in time? Okay. So what are you doing, person B? Bragging to your peer about what you've purposefully done, not accidentally done, purposefully done in the last seven days just to make sure you were getting your $20 million, your $2 million, your $5 million worth out of your team. You've got, please, 45 seconds to create some eyebrowsing raising moments for person A as they quietly think about what they're going to say when it's their turn. Okay, so... <laughs> 
Um, person B, you've got 45 seconds to impress person A with your leadership effectiveness. Go. Thank you. Now, I recognise I'm interrupting the time there, and that's purposefully so that we can finish here on time. Person A, thanks for pretending to listen. I'd like you now to just reverse the roles. What have you purposefully done? It's a scary amount of revenue that disappears out of the bottom line of our businesses, out of your hospital, out of your surgery every single year. What did you do purposefully in the last seven days to make sure that you were getting your four, five, 10, 200,000, whatever you're in charge of worth? Your turn, please, person eight, go. And thank you. Now, What's the good news? Um, can you please just give me an indication if the person that you're speaking to is genuinely someone who was least known to you up until this particular point in time? Just so I know that most of you are talking to strangers, which is good. So you could have lied right then and they won't know whether you actually did what you said or you just trotted off a bit of management rhetoric to say, oh, yeah, you know, I've been uh, doing a bit of management by walking around or, no, I had a meeting with all my creative geniuses just to talk about trends in the industry, just to find out what they might have seen or heard. I'm not sure what you said. But what do I know is that people do weird things for people. People go out of their way to do things for people if the relationship is right if they are genuinely engaged, engaged. I wonder, and this is out of Canada, I have to tell you, this particular photograph. <laughs> How many people recognise that this particular municipality had effective, efficient processes, systems, even manuals on how things are supposed to be done exactly to the highest quality standard, but this in Australian terms is a little bit of like, well, there's a bit of feedback for you, boss. I would love to punch you in the face, but I can't, so I'll work out other ways. Oh, you wanted that report today. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant next Monday. Oh, the meeting started at two, I beg your pardon, I must have put it down in my diary wrong. I'll be prompt on Thursday. Again, I wonder what people are doing seriously to go out of their way for you. In terms of the amount of money that we spend on wages, contractors every single year, what are you doing in that space to make sure that the culture is right? Because culture will eat strategy for breakfast every single day. It matters if you walk into a room that the lights aren't working, but rarely do senior leaders have the same sense of urgency attached to what it means to get the most out of the $20 million out of the bottom end of your revenue statement. What if it had that same sense of urgency? What if it had that same sense of this really matters? If I'm paying this money, how do I know that I'm actually getting my money's worth, that I'm converting all of that to productive, effective, efficient, engaged employees? So person B. I'm going to ask you to share one more thing because I think your leadership actually determines the culture. And we've kind of been testing already. I know you've done lots of thinking today, but I'm interested in testing. I'm going to ask you, person B, to volunteer some information that relates to the culture that you dictate. If I worked around you, even as your direct reports, what's my sense of you? Am I excited to see the front of you or am I more excited to see the back of you? When you go on holidays, is that the best four weeks of my year? Or is it the most stressful four weeks of my year because I'm without your mentoring, your leadership, your guidance, your enthusiasm, your energy that you bring into this space? So person B, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. When I invited you to stand up and find a partner, I introduced a little bit of change into your world. A little bit of out of the status quo. A little bit of uh, go and do something different, like the marketplace demands of us every single day. I'm wondering, person B, with that little voice inside your head, who hears little voices? Has everyone got little voices? You've got to know we're not talking about that at this conference, okay? <laughs> Some people still looking at me blankly. That's that little voice now going, I wonder what little voice he's talking about. That little voice. <laughs> when I invited you to stand up and find a partner, when something in life presented to you just a little bit different than what you expected, I'm curious how many of you went straight to humour, joy, gratefulness, going awesome. I get a bit lazy at these events, this could be fun. Last session of the day, at least I get to stand up and stretch. I know that people sit down all day and more likely they have higher incidence of bowel cancer. I did see that paper, so I'm good to get a bit of movement on here. This is good. Some of you would have in that one three hundredth of a second, that pre-programmed neural pathway amygdala response went to joy. Would have been at least two, maybe three. I suggest that some of you didn't go to the top drawer and maybe you don't go to the top drawer when life presents itself in a way that you weren't expecting. Some of you would have gone to the bottom drawer and put the cranky pants on. 
And your internal dialogue in that one three hundredth of a second, that blink of eye, would have been potentially more like, oh, God, one of these sessions. Seriously? What's happened at this conference? Oh, I better not be touching anyone. I'm not touching anyone. There's no touching going on here. I don't want to talk to anyone. I had to go one hour and 15 minutes and then I could go and get ready to drink and now I have to go and do something. I don't want to have to think. I wonder where you went. So person B, I'm inviting you to put that out there because if your leadership dictates the culture, if I worked with you and something like life presents to you in a way that you weren't expecting, then I wonder what you dictate in your organisation should be the response, not by your good intentions but by what you actually do. Not by what's written in the mission statement about being a flexible and adaptable and, you know, uh, respondent to patient needs. I'm asking you to be thinking about what's the culture that you say is okay or not, just when life presents itself in a different way. So please, person B, you're going to start the conversation. I know this is a little transparent, but I'm asking you to keep the rule that what happens on camp stays on camp with your partner. So please, person B, where did you go? Were you one of those people going, oh, good. Like, are you the kind of person, if I was driving in a car with you and you were two blocks from home and there was a detour sign, would go, oh, awesome. I've never been down this street. I've lived 10 years in this neighbourhood. I've never been down this street. Oh, this could be fun. Or are you the person straight away into the bottom drawer, cranky pants on, going, oh, bloody council, this time of the day, why don't they do it? There was no notice given to me. Like, where did that go for you? If I work with you when life presents itself a little differently, where do you go? Person B, your 30 seconds. Go. Make sure you swap it over. Person A, chime in with your opinion, please. And thank you. Now, what I suspect in talking to reasonable adults on a regular basis, I get some feedback from people to say, well, I didn't go to the top drawer and go, oh, this will be fun. I'm just going to get in and have a good go. Oh, I didn't put the cranky pants on and go, oh, this stupid activity, I hate activities. But I went to the middle drawer. How many people tried to justify a middle drawer? Did they? Well, I didn't. I just, the jury was out. Can I suggest to you in terms of culture, in terms of your leadership effectiveness, in terms of what people would do in response to you, there is no middle draw. I don't think there is any neutral. You're either adding to something or you're taking away. You're contributing positively or you're diminishing from it. So please, person B, before person A gets a chance to go and sit down again, I'm going to ask you to deliver a 30-second speech to person A. What does our research tell us is that most leaders aren't very effective in their speech making, so here's a chance for you to do a little practice. Person B, if I was to work with you, why would you be so much fun to work with? Why would I look forward to seeing the front of you and not the back of you? Why would I be genuinely excited about the fact that I got to do 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years of my life with you? So you're going to deliver that 30-second speech, person B. Person A, you're going to wait the 30 seconds and I'm going to ask you to stop and you'll be pretending to listen to person B while you're thinking about what you're going to say. Same as before. You've got 30 seconds. Why would you be fun to work with? Go. Thank you. Person B, let me just offer you a challenge, Person A. And you know who you are, Person B. There was quite a few of you. I'm guessing around about 25%. After you got about to the 10 or 15 second mark, kind of ran out of content and started looking at me, hoping that the 30 seconds was up. <laughs> you know who you are. So Person A, there's a fair bit of pressure on you to do the whole 30 seconds. Your time starts now. Go. Thank you. Now, a very simple, easy to answer question, bearing in mind it is the last session of the day. How many people are already feeling quite excited that you're going to spend almost another hour with this person? Who's looking seriously? <laughs> Out of all the people I could have got, I've got this person. Keep your hand up if you're feeling a fair bit of peer pressure to put your hand up for that question. 
Well, I'm sorry, if you did get a dud, you're going to need them two or three more times, so you're going to have to really put this first principle into practice. Um, why is this important? I think there are two things in terms of why we matter. How many of our teams are experiencing ambivalence? And when I say ambivalence, how many of your team love their job? And the research that I've done into this industry, and it's interesting, my partner has just completed her nursing qualification, and we had some good conversations about what it meant for her in her early experience. Every person that she's bumped into so far loves her job. The people that I know that work in your industry love their job, but how many people love the company just as much as they love the job? That's the challenge. That ambivalence is incredibly draining. I love my job, but I just don't like working for you. I love my job, but I just don't like working for this hospital. I love my job, but I don't like working for you or this hospital. And that's the story that they tell people at the Saturday night barbecue conversation. So please, thank your partner. Say goodbye. You won't need them again. <laughs> Not for another few minutes, please. Come and get yourself comfortable again. If you don't want to go back to your original seat because that's just too much hard work, get a little flexible and creative and just plonk down where you need to plonk. Tomorrow, I promise you that you are going to spend some time with a couple of amazing people and you would have seen them on the program. They're going to talk to you a lot more about this issue of humour. If it isn't fun, how do you make it fun? And one of the things that we do with our clients, particularly professional services firms where people get to be in an office, and if people have got the cranky pans on, we have an agreement with them. For those of you trying to manage people, you should really give, in, give up the notion of managing people. My encouragement to you is what do you do to manage agreements? What are the agreements that you have in place with the people that you work with? Is there an agreement in place to bring the person that turned up at the job interview to work almost every day? Not every day, because that would be quite nauseous, but almost every day. Is that agreement in place? Is there agreement to say, how do you bring your best version of you into this workspace? You bring the humour and the gratefulness into this space, curiosity, problem solving, flexibility. Is there an agreement in place? And one of the companies I work with, and I've just come back from three weeks of touring cities in the United States. One of my clients in New York City employs 600 people, a professional services firm that does tax, auditing, finance. Last year when I was there, I'm talking to Jim because they have the agreement in place that if you've got the cranky pants on and you've been sucking the energy out of life, you're going to get an email. And when you get the email, it has a video attached to it. And the agreement is that you will turn up the speakers on your computer and you will play the video. C.S. Lewis said people would rather be reminded than instructed. It's a beautiful reminder that we have an agreement. Please be the person that turned up at the job interview. We want that person to stay here. And as your manager, I'm going to do everything that I can to remind you who that person is and make sure that you are feeling like this is the environment where you can come and be that person. And what cracked me up last year when I was talking to Jim, imagine 180 people in workstations and the 20 nice offices around the outside in Union Square. They're the ones with the view. Everyone else is buried in the middle, tapping away in their workstation. And we heard the music doo, 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 from the film clip. Someone was getting some feedback to say that they suck. Would you please stop doing that and come back and bring the best version of you to work? And what cracked us up, Jim and I are standing there on the outside. There's all these workstations that are about yay high, but you could see all these people in one little area popping their head up going, it was like meerkats having a look around to see who was getting some feedback. Um, I want to show you the video. It's not our video. It was one that we got off the internet some nine years ago and we're continuing the viral program, much to the joy of this company and much to an annual check that we asked them for, for doing it. It's kind of hard not to laugh, but I have to tell you, I've been at conferences including one in the United States that was a safety conference. There's like 10,000 people there and a person came up to me at the morning tea break and said, I hope you realise that you're at a safety conference, mate. <laughs> that video you showed in the first session was, we have a zero harm policy that was incredibly inappropriate for what we're trying to achieve here. 
All I could think in my head was like, have a nice cancer, mate, because you are going to go early. That's the only good news about your view of the world in that particular space. We now know that the research will tell us that. And one of my other personal things to do, and you'll be having a lot more time on this subject tomorrow. How many people have in some of your staff rooms the cranky pants signs? Has anyone got the cranky pants signs up in the staff room? Things like, your mother doesn't work here, wash up your own stinking cup. Has anyone seen those signs? Um, your arms aren't painted on your moron, give it a switch around. An engineering firm that I work with here in this city, six floors, two staff rooms on each floor. Every single staff room had the same sign that said, any food left in the fridge at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon will be systematically destroyed. Plastic containers will be microwaved down into unrecognisable pieces of petrochemical and disposed of in the receptacle beside the refrigerator. I'm like going, feeling the love just here. There's a lot of joy here in this place. So I take down the cranky pants signs and I put up other stupid posters and quotes. And what cracks me up is by the time I get to the airport, my client will ring me and just go, just so you know, the person who puts up the cranky pants signs has gone into the staff room to see that the cranky pants sign has been taken down and your stupid poster has been put up and now they are even more cranky. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm glad I don't have to work with them every day, seriously. Um, the first one I put up, and I'll only show you two, um, this came out of an Indianapolis newspaper. <laughs> put the caption on the photograph. This was the winner of the previous week's competition. What do I love about this venue, and I've presented in this venue many times, is the screen is great, Dave. Seriously, that is so clear. Um, how many people don't want to look, but they're kind of fixated on it as well? There's like people sniffing fingers, all sorts of things going on. P.S., by the way, could you wash up your cup? The other one I put up, and just to finish on this chunk, the whole humour helps bit. I got some feedback. We did 360 degree management feedback with our management team. We've been doing it for about 15 years. One of the gauges on our dash while we're trying to fly straight and level. And... I got some feedback from my staff that said, Bruce, at times you can be nauseatingly positive. If you could just turn it down a little bit, every now and then that would be great. And I said, look, thanks for the feedback. And so you know I live by a quote by Albright that says, having a positive attitude will not solve all of your problems, but it will annoy enough people to make it worthwhile. Okay, so um, I did agree, though, to be a little more sarcastic because that was one of their recommendations. A little more sarcasm, Bruce, would be good. And I did tell them that sarcasm was the lowest form of wit, in which they retorted with, well, who cares, it's still a form of wit. Uh, 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 cracked themselves up. So I went to the CEO that I know in this country that is the most cynical CEO that I've ever worked with, ever. Works in Melbourne, half a million dollar a year CEO with her 200 employees, doing great things. And I asked her initially when I first met her, I said, how do you motivate your staff? And she goes, well, quite simply, we pay them. Deadpan. I said, how do you know that motivates them? She goes, try not paying them. <laughs> she cracked herself up. So I rang Vivian. I said, I need some help. My staff had told me I need to be a little more sarcastic and a little less so positive. And I said, okay, well, good. And she sent me this quote, which I put up in my office, much to my HR team's disgust. Some people are like slinkies. Does everyone know slinkies? The curly, plasticky, worry things. Some people are like slinkies. They don't really have a purpose. Who's got people's names popping up in your head already? Seriously? They don't really have a purpose, but they still bring a smile to your face when you push them down the stairs. Seriously? You've done it, I've done it. How many people have sat in your car at the end of the day and you're watching one of your own staff members walking across the car park? And it's late and it's night time and you're thinking, I know how to make this look like an accident. <laughs> I'm picturing the paperwork that I need to do already and it's like, Doo -doo. seriously, humour seriously helps and you'll be invested in that big time tomorrow and I encourage you to come along with your happy pants on and be a part of that process. But what is it like? What's my experience of you? When something comes along, how am I expected to react based on you, how you react, on what you dictate in terms of culture? Are you asking me to be engaged with humour, problem-solving, curiosity, or are you asking me to engage with whinging, complaining, cranky pants? Like, what are you asking me? What are you dictating as a result of your own behaviour in terms of how I am allowed to or supposed to or OK to behave in this particular space? And it makes a big difference. And the second one I want to talk about, if you thought that was kind of weird, the second one's even more cultish. How many people here are involved in a cult of some sort? Anyone? All of us are. Every single person's in their own cult. How many people here belong to a family? <laughs> How many people believe in your own family? There are special practices and, tra and traditions that you could not really share publicly, honestly. Who's got a few of those things? You know, No one would understand. It's just going on in our house. It's just going on in our family. Same thing true for business. And I think what's one of the biggest things missing 
in every business in terms of engagement is this issue of a generation of people now that are dependent on gratefulness, yet are immersed in cynicism. Who would agree as a culture? And it's interesting to be back in Aussie after three weeks in the United States. Who would agree that generally we're a little more cynical than we are grateful? Has anyone picked up that clue? And I'm not talking grateful in the guilt-ridden way that you might have got as a kid. Who got guilt-ridden gratefulness bestowed on you as a kid? Keep your hand up if you're a Catholic. You know, you understand. <laughs> we were all there. I remember. Who remembers as a kid getting that you should be grateful that you've got a roof over your house? Over a roof over your... You know, has anyone had the roof over their head? You know, you've got a house. And we used to get the Monty Python skit. Did anyone get the Monty Python skit? You know, we used to live in a shoebox in the middle of a freeway. You've got no <laughs> idea, you kids, what it's like. Honestly, who got the one on food? Oh, you should be grateful there's food on your plate. There are people starving in only one continent, Africa. Every other continent was fine. It's the same in the United States. They used to blame Africa too. South America was fine. Asia was fine. Everyone else was fine. But Africa was starving. And I remember at age 13, which is kind of weird because I have a 13-year-old now, I said to my dad at age 13, if you care so much about these people in Africa, name one. <laughs> well, I got a bit of feedback that night. <laughs> It was kind of in the form of a physics lesson, really, because it was the first night that I really realised that my father could move faster than the speed of light. I did not see him move from the other side of the table, but I felt something. I think he probably would have got 10 years for what he did to me that night, honestly. So I'm not talking that kind of guilt-ridden gratefulness, but I'm talking about what oozes out of you. What's the culture dictated by you as the senior leader in your hospital, in your organisation, in your group of people that you are looking for? Does humour and gratefulness ooze out of you, problem solving, curiosity, or does maybe cynicism, cranky pants, whinging, complaining, criticism ooze out of you? What's my experience of you? So I'm going to ask you to do something really weird with your partner. So please, this is going to test the boundaries of your flexibility and your sense of humour. Even when I just said that out loud, I wonder how many of you have gone, awesome, this is going to be fun, bring it on, OK? I don't mind flexibility. You want to work a little part-time? Sure, we can work out some part-time work. Yeah, you want a job share? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, no problems, just bring it on, let's look at it, we'll solve it. I wonder how many of you, when I'm inviting you now to even just go and do something that you don't even know yet with your partner, have maybe already gone to the cranky pants going, oh, jeez. I should have left at afternoon tea, then I wouldn't have had to do any of this. So what am I going to do? So there'll be no touching, but please stand, go and find your person A, person B. Huh. And it, just help me and pretend to do it with a happy heart, if you would. Just pretend. Oh, there's a bit of love going on here. Yeah, you're sucking up to the MC. That's it. Person A, where are you? Person A, this is going to be the weirdest thing you've ever done at a conference. In fact, what do I know life looks like for most people? How many people have had whole weeks that look like this? Get up in the morning, get organised, go to work, come home, alcohol injection, go to bed. Get up in the morning, get organised, go to work, come home, alcohol injection, go to bed. Get up in the morning, alcohol injection. Yes, you've been there. <laughs> Seriously, with or without the alcohol injection, people get to the end of the year. And who would agree that when people get to the end of the year, they're generally surprised that it's the end of the year? Has anyone heard your intelligent Mensa graduate friends coming up to you in voices in two or three octaves higher than they would normally speak, saying something really ridiculous like, where's the year gone? I can't believe it's November already. I can't help but look at them and go, well, congratulations, you were there in October. <laughs> uh, the Gregorian calendar has been running this way for over 500 years. The Pope made the decree that happened. It was before the Reformation, actually, and so people were still paying attention to us back then, and that's how this worked, and this went. It's like, why are we surprised? Well, because I think we spend a lot of time not doing the things with the finite amount of energy that we get every day that are going to be genuine adding to. We do a lot of stuff that's taking away. I have a very rose-coloured metaphor about four-year-olds. How many people have their own four-year-old? Can I just see? How many people have had a four-year-old but they've rolled on in years? So I can just see. Good, and just so no one feels left out, who's at least been four <laughs> at some particular point? Honestly, what does it mean to have that energy? I've got two kids, 13 and 17. Neither of them at age four would have come up to me and said something like, Dad, it's been hell out there in the sandpit today, mate. <laughs> Dead set, you know, I've had a couple of bridges go down, I've had a truck go over, and frankly, I've had enough. So I'm just going to push upstairs for a couple of hours. If you could wake me up in time for dinner and keep the noise down too, would you, mate? Seriously, it's just... <laughs> How many people know that is never going to happen? Not ever. 
And when it comes to your energy, four-year-olds are more likely to be, in this metaphor, a little more grateful than they are cynical. If you ask four-year-olds to stand up and find a partner, yeah, cool, awesome, great. You don't even have to wait for the instruction to be finished. They're ready to go. You ask adults to go up and find a partner going, oh, it's going to be one of these sessions. I don't want to... Like, where does it go? Four-year-olds don't typically ooze cynicism or whinging. Four-year-olds don't even whinge. To their mates, that is. <laughs> whinging to parents is lobbying, advocating uh, <laughs> integrity and intention. Four-year-olds, seriously, would not come up to other four-year-olds and go, I don't know what your parents are like, mate, but mine are stupid. No, seriously, I've asked my parents 50 times for this present. I've left the Kmart catalogue out, the Target catalogue out, the warehouse catalogue out. I tell you, I'm on stress leave next week. You will not see me at kindy. It's just too much for me. I'm just not going. It doesn't happen. There are some good lessons we can take in that space. And one of these issues is cynicism. A typical four-year-old today in Brisbane would not be waking up going, oh, great, Monday. Thank goodness this is a short week at kindergarten because I don't think I could do the long week. What's the bet we'll be finger painting? One more stinking day. I'm actually tactile and tolerant. You think that would come up at some point, but so much for productive pedagogy. I don't think some of these people are qualified. Thank goodness they put some governance in this industry because it's just ridiculous. Seriously, people turn it up and keeping us busy for the day while the oldies go out and earn a bit of cash, you know, and then we'll have to lay down with our blankets after four o'clock and have a bit of a nap, you know. That's just stupid. That's just because they're lazy. They don't want to have a cup of tea, get ready for tomorrow. They don't want to do anything. It's not happening in the head, but you listen to the conversations that happen typically over a dinner table. How many people have played? Who's had the worst day competition with the other intelligent people in your house? And you're not the winner of that competition until you're the most miserable person in your house. <laughs> I wonder how that plays out in your business. How many people are going, oh, I've got the worst job. I've got the worst boss. I'm working for the worst hospital competition. As opposed to something that might say... How do we just bring some gratefulness in? I'm just glad you turned up today. I know it's five to five and you've answered 327 phone calls today because I checked. I just love it the way you answer the phone call, just like that at five to five. Really? That's awesome. Who's coming in at five? Good. Tell them I said hi. Like, when was the last time that happened? And people look at me like I'm weird, so let's do something weird. Person A, you're going to start. You're going to serve up person A. And you're going to serve up a little, I'm grateful for. Person B is going to respond with, I'm grateful for. Person A is going to respond with, I'm grateful for. And you're going to rally backwards and forwards in a game called gratefulness tennis. How do you win a point? Quite simply, if someone uses the same thing that you've already used in your rally, 15 love, love 15, serve it up again, person A. Once something has been introduced, you cannot use it again. The other way you win a point is you pay attention to the return of serve, to the return of your stroke, because if they have any pause, any written uto, for those of you musically inclined, any idiosyncratic utterance, any I'm grateful for, anything in slow motion, claim the point, it's self-regulating here, and then you get to serve it up again, person A. Everyone understand what's going to happen? 45 seconds, your goal is to take a couple of games off your partner, um, and in three, you'll just be able to rally around like a round robin. Go. 45 seconds. Thank you, and that's time. Finished, please. Finished. Will you please do the customary handshake? Stay with your partner for one more moment. Now, I'd like an honest show of hands, and I need to be able to see everyone. How many people thought that was kind of the weirdest thing you've ever done at a conference? Can I just see a show of hands? I'm talking while the conference was on. Um, no doubt you would have done other weirder things outside of that space. Check into your own physical and mental health even right now. I mean, who would agree after 45 seconds of a little gratefulness tennis, you're probably in better shape than if you had just done 45 seconds of who's had the worst day competition so far? Honestly, in terms of the energy, in terms of productivity, in terms of engagement, in terms of the responsibility upon you, not just me. I don't want me to be the only person in this room working. I want to change people's role to change their attitude. So as much as you might want to be cynical at me, it's pretty hard for you to be cynical at your partner. Does that make sense? As much as you might have been going, mm, guess who turned up to your partnership? The person that turned up to your partnership was the person that turned up at the job interview. When you turned up at the job interview, when you met your partner today, it would have been, g'day, how's it going? I saw you guys even having a little cuddle there, which is kind of weird. Um, <laughs> and, and can I just say also, uh, inappropriate, uh, just so you know, just so I've just covered off my HR obligations. Um, it's not that it may offend you, it may offend others. So it's just not, not just about you, it's about the impact that it may have on other people. So. Um, that's who turned up to this person. What are you doing to keep people back on that space? I could have had you sit for an hour and 15 minutes and offer you me cynicism and cranky pants and going, come on, let's go, we need to get out of here at six so that we can be right on time for tonight. 
Oh, no, I was just testing people's humour. <laughs> wonder how many instantly right then went, ha, 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 Or went, no, we better not be here at 6 o'clock. I was told 5 o'clock, this better be 5 o'clock. What's going on, 5 o'clock? Like, honestly, what happened just in that moment? Something that was already predetermined before you came to this conference. What happens at your workspace when something presents itself that wasn't what you were expecting? What oozes out of you in that space? What do we dictate to our teams that should happen as a result of that? So please, last thing with your partner, have a look at them. Okay, that's enough. Back at me. <laughs> How many people know at some stage in the future, and this is a year 10 science question, so regardless of your background, if you're an administrator, I'm not asking you to have necessarily any surgical knowledge, but how many people know at some stage in the future that your partner will be dead? Just have a look. Okay. Good. Thank you. It's a year 10 science question. Please, will you look at your partner again? Okay, that's enough. Back at me. Here's the value judgment. Please put your hand up if you think your partner may go before you. Anyone think that could be true? <laughs> we don't talk about it much, but honestly, who would agree when it comes to gratefulness that waking up is a great start? Seriously? If you wake up and there's no white chalk line around your body, you've got to go, amen, that's pretty cool, okay? Um, that's where the gratefulness starts oozing out of me. In the morning, God's given me one more day to go and play and be adding to the world, not taking away from the world. There is no neutral. I'm either adding to something or I'm taking away. How are you adding to? So please, say goodbye to your partner because you may not ever see them again. <laughs> you know better than anyone that this is the truth. Say goodbye, come back and grab a seat, please. Thank you. It happens even at conferences. Hopefully that's not true this time, Francis, because that would be awkward. we would have to sort of drag everyone out of the way and do a separate session. A couple of things on gratefulness. How many people here have ever had an argument? Can I just see a quick show of hands? Who's ever had an argument and even when you found out that you were wrong, you continued to argue that you were right? Has anyone ever had that experience? Seriously. And then on the way home, particularly in the car, you are now thinking of all the things that you should have said in the argument after the argument. Who's had that experience? Seriously, you're driving home and you're thinking, you've just had the board, me board meeting and you would have gone, that would have shut them right up. Right? Well... We now know that physiologically you are incapable of actually going into that part of your brain that is the most logical, creative part of your brain, that prefrontal cortex. You are buried deep in cynicism. What does it look like? You've got the cranky pants on. You're barely stuck in a part of your brain that is keeping your heart beating. I'd like to suspect that your shareholders would, if you've got a $20 million payroll, would rather you have up in your neocortex and have every single person that worked for you up in their neocortex making really good decisions, creating, problem solving, being curious, as opposed to being stuck into whinging, moaning, complaining, just keeping my heart beating part of my brain. I need people to bring their best version of them to work every single day. So how do I demonstrate this issue of gratefulness? Because I know that treating employees equally is incredibly unfair. It is incredibly unfair. And here's where, as managers, our responsibility comes. And for you with your direct reports and then charging and getting an agreement with your direct reports that they will go and do exactly the same. How do you know what turns people on in your business? It isn't always just the extra yoga class. Some of the things that turn people on from our research is leadership. I love working for someone who's going to be someone worth following. It's the leadership. I'm here because of the leadership. Culture is really good. Strategy is kind of a little bit weak, but what do we know? I've seen really, really, really poor strategy executed effectively well and improve and get better until you've got a world-class strategy that mat matches the culture. The leadership brings that out of people. What else might be? Opportunity. I just want your job one day. Simple as that. I don't even want extra money. I don't want leadership. I'm going to watch you, but I'm already thinking I could do it better than you. Still don't even know how you got the job. Really, you must have naked photos of someone because there's no way you could be doing it as good as me. So I'm just, I've got an eye. There's opportunity here. And at the base level, what does that mean? Opportunity to learn and grow and develop to do something differently this week than what I did last week. Um, the whole issue of reward. I've got staff members that I know that if I took them for coffee, would not be interested. If I spent some time with them having an informal one-on-one, -on -one, they'd be like kind of going, what are we here for? Being curious, just want to have a chat. And we still do that and we do that formally and informally, but what do I know that would suit them better? They'd rather I gave them a $50 my voucher and just tap them on the head and say, great job, thanks. I want to be acknowledged just by some extra pay. Um, purpose. I like the cause of what we're doing. I belong here. I see what we're doing. I see what we're doing as an institution, as a church, as a hospital, as a surgery. I'm in touch with the purpose. You can pay me whatever I want. I don't, I'm just going to turn up. 
I love my job and if I love my company as well, gosh, then you're going to get the person that turned up at the job interview at the same time. Job fulfilment. Do I every day, and this came out of the Gallup Q12 questions, do I every day get a chance to do what I like to do, what I'm good at? Do we know what people are good at in our organisations and do they get the chance to actually do that? Yes, they applied for that role, but they were just happy to get in. What do they love to do every day? Every day? They love to do this, not that, but I'm doing this because one day I'd love to do that. You get me doing something that I really get energised about every single day and then that's the person that turned up at the job interview. Um, the issue of relationships. Some people will stay in an environment plugged in and if you think about the relationship that you've started with your person A, person B, person C, where applicable, how many people would figure that your life might go a little quicker and more fun and more easy if you could have more time with your existing partner that you've met today? Who's already off to a good start? Yeah, tonight you'll be looking out for them, looking sharp, nice. Thanks for this afternoon, can I get you another drink? Okay, um, good things will happen as a result of that relationship and that's that genuine reciprocity in that area. And the whole issue for some people and not everyone is this issue of work-life balance. All of these things are moving targets. I don't know where you fit in, which are the ones that you like, which are the ones that you don't like, what turns you on? What are the top two or three for you that would be key engagement drivers so that you could make sure that you were plugged into what you're doing? Maybe you're not doing some of the stuff that you need to do. Maybe you need to have a little restructure in your job design to make sure that you're not doing some of the things that turn you into a cranky, miserable person and start doing some of the things that you get more job fulfilment from. Why are you doing some of those things when you may have the capacity to grow someone else who's looking for opportunity, who's looking for purpose? Maybe there are some things that you're doing right now and how do you just move all of those things around so everybody can be in the right place at the right time for them? And the only way that happens is with the conversation. So what are you doing to demonstrate gratefulness? How does it come out of you every single day? Um, I know in a world that loves Facebook, who is on Facebook? Can I just see a show of hands? Just admit it. What do we know about Facebook? And a lot of people don't want to know about this, Francis, but can I just tell you, am I allowed to just come down here again? How many people love it when you post something and somebody likes your post? Where are you? Come on, you'd be lying if you didn't put something up there and you're hoping one of your three or four friends on Facebook didn't come and just go, I like what you, yeah. Now, what are we talking about our other generations? And I listened to the professor. We've got generations with letters we don't even know yet. They're addicted to that electronic media. What are you doing to like what they do? You're working with a generation of people now that will take a picture of their breakfast <laughs> and put it on Facebook and want their mates to go, oh, nice bacon and eggs. Wish I was there. We've got a generation of people now, even as mature age adults, that are addicted to this issue of like me, like me, like me, like me, I love it. And what do we know from the research? That you get the same increase in oxytocin levels when you get a like on your Facebook page than you get with a hug or a decent handshake from someone that you really care about. Now, the cynics go, oh, that's just ridiculous, that's not going to last, this is just stupid. Good. And meanwhile, you may not be getting your $20 million out of your payroll. Simple as, what are you doing to like them? Oh, look, thanks very much. You didn't kill that person. Great job, okay? Um, thanks for doing that. No, thanks for fixing that up. Thanks for answering the telephone. What are you doing every single day just to make sure that you're oozing gratefulness, that that's what comes out of you? Because what's the assumption? The assumption is this. Every single person in this room, I suspect, has good intentions. Please, do something for me. Have a look at the person on your right-hand side where you're sitting. Have a look at the person on your left-hand side. Obviously, if there's no person either side of you, that's a bit of feedback for you, okay? <laughs> um, but please, how many people suspect the people either side of you have good intentions? Who would agree that's fairly true? Yes, that's the general acceptance. I've never been at a Saturday night barbecue yet where I've come up to someone and said, hey, mate, how's work? No one's ever said, yeah, yeah, good, mate. Good in what way? Well, there's a couple of people at work that still respect me. <laughs> Takes a role to get around and earn the disrespect of intelligent people, but... Um, most of them are too forgiving, really, but it won't take long. There's a couple of people now that I reckon uh, in a couple of months' time they'll be glad to see the back of me as well. Yeah, I'm going pretty good. Who would agree no one's ever going to say that out loud? They're never going to say that out loud, but, but, if you followed them around at work for two weeks, you'd be going, I reckon he's on track for that. <laughs> Not based on the intention. Everyone allegedly has got good intentions. I've never been at the Saturday night barbecue and say, hey, how's things going at home? Oh, better than I thought. Better in what way? Well, I've managed to shut down the intimacy. It wasn't easy. Constant criticism was the key. My kids don't interrupt me now while the football's on, which is really good, and my partner doesn't interrupt me at all. In fact, um, we 
single-handedly, just me on my own, have uh, destroyed the emotional and intellectual intimacy in that relationship, just with the constant criticism. And uh, yeah, it shouldn't be long. Six months, you know, there'll be the affair, then the divorce, and then I can go and do the same damage to someone else. So yeah, I'm going pretty good. Now, no one's going to say that out loud. Is that true? Not ever are they going to say that out loud. But if you followed them around at home for two weeks, you'd be going, actually, I reckon they're on track for that. So please do this for me. Have a look at the person on your right-hand side for the last time. Have a look at the person on your left-hand side. Who would agree, despite their good intentions, they could lift their game just a little bit? If you didn't put your hand up, you didn't understand the question. You don't need to be here. You need to be somewhere on a statue so we can come and bow down to you and go, good job you. Honestly, everyone's got good intentions. 1992, I took this photograph. And if you're old enough and quick look around the room, most of you were there. Who remembers when you took photographs and it was a commercial decision? You had the film and then the processing. So I only took two photographs, one from the front, one from the back. A registered licensed street seller on the streets of New York City. In fact, it was the first time that I was in New York City. And this guy has got good intentions. This guy's creating his own enterprise. He's not waiting for a government handout. He's actually out there having a crack, you might say. <laughs> Recycling before it was trendy. Romance before Rudy had turned up as the mayor. All good intentions. Despite his good intentions, who would agree he could lift his game just a little bit? <laughs> That's the paradox. And it's not wholesale change. Most people, and I love the professor's comment about culture, just needs a nudge. Just needs a nudge. People need to be reminded to be the person that turned up at the job interview. Can you get, remember that person? What have we got to do to create an environment where that person would come out again? What kind of accountability? What kind of resources? I remember going to one place where they had good intentions, but good intention is not enough. And it's his last principle. There is no neutral. No one's judging our good intentions. They're judging our behaviour and impacts. And the boss is asking me, he said, oh, look, we've got an engagement problem. Oh, okay. That means we've probably got a leadership problem. Could I talk to the staff? Because he wanted me to come in and fix the staff. That's why sometimes you've got to leave the HR people out of the equation because they want to come in and fix people. When maybe what you and I need to do is just lead a little more effectively, be a little more inspirational, a little more encouraging, a little more sensitive, a little more flexible in what we do things. Not wholesale change, but just that little fine tuning. And I went and talked to the staff what do they want? Oh, it'd be good if we could just get a microwave in the lunchroom. That'd be good. Wouldn't mind a fridge that kept everything cold until lunchtime. Most people bring their own esky with a little esky brick because it's not worth putting it in the fridge. We watch the boss, he drives out there in his Audi A5 and we're just getting our esky out one more time watching him go. Who would agree he doesn't need any program? He just needs to be paying attention to the people that he's with. What turns them on? What are the resources? What are the structure? What are the systems? What's the leadership that needs to go with that? I'm always amazed that people lose weight at the health farm. Who's ever been to something like the Golden Door Health Retreat? You've weighed in on the Friday night, you've paid your 2,000 bucks for the week, you are ready to go and you weigh in, they put the calipers on you, a little awkward, but they take all the little measurements and they do all those things and then you're into it all week, up at six o'clock to do some Tai Chi, no coffee, no caffeine, no cigarettes, no alcohol. It's amazing. You're amazing. Friday, you get on the scale, you are just the demigod of pure effectiveness in terms of your own health. How many people, if you've been to one of these and now driving home, and if you live in this area, you would know coming from the Golden Door Health Retreat back to the airport, there's a little place on the side of the road, a little sign about that big that says Yatla Pies. If you've ever had a yatla pie, you'll dream about them for a long, long time until you get to have one again, particularly with the peas and the gravy and the potato. You're the same person that left that place just a little while ago, but now you're in a different environment. You're making that decision on your own. I mean, your staff are making that decision on their own. What's the decision they're going to make when you can't be there to control that environment? What do you need to do to be able to impact that person who is in the car about to go through the drive through at Yatla Pies? With what's going on in their head, a story that doesn't match your mission statement a story that doesn't match your goals, a story that doesn't match the things that you say that you want in your hospital, your facility. The story doesn't match. Because who would agree when you're at the Golden Door Health Retreat and you're saying goodbye to everyone on Friday afternoon, it's hugs all round and you're feeling fantastic. You're in good shape. And guess what? The leadership supported you. The structure supported you. You could not finish the tofu beans at lunch and then go back to your room and go to the mini bar and knock down some cashews and a little scotch and soda out of the mini bar. Who would agree you couldn't do that? 
When you walk past the kitchen, the staff weren't sitting there having a cigarette and a beer and a bit of pizza going, oh, mate, sorry about the beans, but, you know, suck it up, okay? Um, there was absolute congruence in the behaviour of the leader. The system, the structure, the resources, it was all there for you to be the best you can be. But my challenge to my managers is when that person's in the car on their own and you're not there providing that environment, you're not there having the conversation, how do you help that person make a really good decision to keep driving up the freeway and go home and have the rice and the fish and something healthy and then live another 20 years? How do you help that person make that decision? How do you help them take that with them so that works? Um, I had a father. How many people here are parents? I think almost everyone. We had a couple of people that have been for. He came to see me. He's the leader of his family. He has good intentions. He's got a great heart. And he says to me one night, because we have a quiet beer, I have to, I had, don't have to explain that to you, because if you, you say to the Americans you're having a quiet beer, they don't understand. It's like, shh, shh, keep it down, mate. Just having a quiet beer. We're just having a quiet beer every fortnight. And I said to Kev, how's it going, mate? And he goes, I want some advice this week, Bruce. You want some advice? You've never asked me for advice. What advice do you want? He said, it's my son. I want to kill him. I said, I don't think I can help you that, with that, Kev. <laughs> Let's Google it. Let's see what comes up. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got out the iPad. He's got the cranky pants on, so turn it down a bit. Bruce, what's going on? He's, he's in grade two this year. I know that. He gets one page of homework on a Monday. He doesn't have to hand it into Friday. What's the problem, Kev? All he does every time we bring up the homework thing, whinge, moan, complain. I said every time. Example, oh, not tonight, Dad. It's top gear tonight and I won't even finish dinner until 7.30 and I have to be in bed at 8 o'clock. Why should I have to do it tonight? Why can't I do it tomorrow night? Wouldn't tomorrow night be better? That's a much better night to do it. Maybe even I could do it Wednesday night, but I don't want to have to do it tonight. You know, and then I think about my pencil and I have to get out my ruler. I have to get out my rubber. I've got to be asleep at 8 o'clock. And it's the same sums. We've already done these sums, Dad, at school. Why should we have to do the same sums again? I don't want to have to do the same sums again. I'm, the words, I've already written out these words three times. Why do I have to do the same words again three times in a row? I said, every time, Kev? He went, every time. Well, what do you want from me? He goes, I want some advice. Are you sure you want some advice or do you just want me to make you feel good? Because most people that want advice just want to be made feel good. They don't actually want advice. No, 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 I want some advice. So you want some advice on your son and why he is the whinging, moaning, complaining about the homework thing? Yes. I'm just getting an agreement and I'm testing that I've got an agreement. Because then I can come back to the agreement, not the person. So much easier. So I said, Kev, well, if you really want some advice, I think the reason why your son whinges, moans and complains about doing his homework is, is because he's your son. I think that pretty much wraps it up, mate. <laughs> he's gone from, what? He's just about spat his beer. He goes, what's that supposed to mean? I said, mate, have you heard what comes out of the hole in the front of your head when you explain life? You still doing that contract in Sydney? Every time I ask you about Sydney, what do you tell me? Oh, you've got to get up early in the stinking Gateway Arterial Road and, you know, there's no road. And if there's a crash there, you're either like an hour and a half on the Gateway or you're an hour and a half in the Qantas Club if there is none of that. And then, you know, you finally get to Sydney. Finally, it's like a 737 takes off out of Brisbane, like with 180 people, and it's a surprise because when you get to Newcastle, you've got to do laps around Newcastle 16 times before you finally get a chance to land. And then no taxi because we're saving costs, so no private car. Wait 45 minutes for a taxi in Sydney on Monday morning with all these people lined up. I could have been doing work, but you can't talk in a taxi, you know, when you got on the... I said, have you ever heard yourself say that, Kev? And he's gone, maybe. <laughs> I said, my favourite example, Kev, honestly, was when we were at Scotty's place for a bit of a barbecue, because in Australia, as you know, we don't have whole barbecues, we just have bits of, bits of them. Come over, mate, having a bit of a barbie. And I dropped my wife upstairs with the champagne and the salad and the other ladies. How are you going, ladies? Good to see you. And then I came down to join the master carnivores at the barbecue. And you were there. And I said, hey, your wife said you guys are going camping next weekend. Do you remember what came out of the hole in the front of your head that night? He's just looked at me and gone, enlighten me. <laughs> I said, what I heard, I have to tell you, Kev, I've told tens of thousands of people all over the world. <laughs> And you know what the good news is, Kev? I haven't even changed your name. <laughs> I figured you married my sister, that's fair game, okay? So I'm just going with it, all right? I said, what I heard you say that night was, is that next weekend? Oh, fair dinkum, you know, by the time you get home Friday night, you pack the stinking car, you're going to drive for two hours, the kids will be feral by the time you get there, it'll be just nauseating, you know, and then I'll be setting up in the dark, I'll be setting up in the dark, they'll be going crazy, the wife will be apologising to all those other families, and then you're off to sleep at 11, they'll be snoring their faces off, I'll be on that stinking air mattress, you never get that right the first night, do you? Too hard, too soft, my missus weighs 65 kilos, I weigh 95 kilos, she's floating up right there on cloud nine, I've got my hips on the ground like crazy trying to get comfy, you can't roll over too quick or you flicker into the ceiling, 
feeling and then, you know, you're almost off to sleep. Your adrenaline has left your body. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're still scratching your head and then you hear a zip go. So you have another panic because you think it's your four-year-old getting up for a walk in the forest. You know you, you know what it's like, fellas. You're the protector of the universe out there in the bush and then you realise it's just someone too tense down just going for a wee and then you think, oh, man, it takes you five minutes to get back on the air mattress so you don't wake up for cheese and kisses and then you're almost off to sleep about 4.30. Rah, rah, rah. You just get that Winchester out of the bag. Dush, 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 dush. Shoot a few of those things and then, you know, oh, man, up for the wheat picks with the UHT milk. That's a bit of a gustatory delight, isn't it? And then all day, snakes, spiders, water hazards, 5.30, the mozzies come out and carry away. And I stopped there. I said, Kev, do you remember this? And he's gone, maybe. I said, I have to tell you, Kev, you divided the group. Half of the group were with you. In fairness, they had the cranky pants on going, oh, yeah, preach it, Kev. Preach it, Kev. Yes. It was like a rally. You could see them just going into whinging, critical, miserable, miserable cynicism. The other half were looking at me going, why did you ask him? I was hallucinating that the flames were coming out of that barbecue and we were thinking, maybe we should just blow out the flames and let the gas come and get it over, Kev, because really... What's the use of living any longer? Now do you know why for five years that you've been married to my sister, we've said no to going camping with you every time? I can't imagine what that would be like for a whole weekend. I wouldn't want to be working with you. Everything that you said is true, but our focus is on the outcome, not the time and effort. On the outcome, not the time and effort. So please, for the last time, will you stand, find your partner? Person A, B, C. Apparently we're not going to six. Just saying, so you know, I'm flexible, I'm happy to, I'll welcome that. I'll just go on with it. If that's what it is, we'll just wrap it up a little earlier. And Person A, person B, person C, where applicable. If you have a person C in your group, let them go first, please, because they've been getting an easy ride. Otherwise, person B, you're going to go first. Person B, I suspect there is no question mark on your intention. Who would agree this business on the other side of the world in the allied health area had good intentions? Who would agree, good intentions attached to this? And if you've done this for your organisation, if you've ever had to do a logo as a senior leader, it's painful. There's the briefing to the graphic artist and then there's the feedback from the graphic artist and then the teams are all deciding what's okay and what's not okay. It could take $20,000 to get to this point. Despite the good intentions of this dentist, who would be nervous to go there for your own <laughs> oral health? I'm not going. Let me show you this ad and then, please, we need to wrap up and you need to have one conversation. What do I love about this ad? It's also from the other side of the world. And there's no question mark about the integrity of the intention. He wants the best possible outcome. I suspect the people that turn up to your world and more people in your industry love their job than other industries, which is a really, really exciting thing that you get to work with. I love my job, love, love my job, job. I love doing what I get to do. Do I love the company or not? What's the fine-tuning that you might do in your leadership example? And I'm not talking wholesale change, just that fine-tuning. If you're old enough and most of you look like you might remember when radios had the dial. Does anyone remember the dial? And you walk into someone's house and you could hear that it wasn't right. And you'd say, excuse me, mate, would you mind if I just touched the radio? And you give it a little nudge. And you go, oh, that's better. What used to crack me up was that they used to go, oh, that's much better. <laughs> Seriously, that's good. So while you're watching this video, I'm asking you to think about what's your fine tuning? What's, to use the professor's term earlier, what's the nudge? Where do you need to give yourself a nudge? In terms of C.S. Lewis, where have you been reminded, not instructed, to go and bring even the best version of you, the person that turned up at the job interview, so that then you can get an agreement with your staff to say, I want that person to turn up every day. What have I got to do? What have we got to do as a collective to have that person turn up to work almost every day? Have a look at this guy. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? I still love that, okay? And I've probably seen it a hundred times, honestly. Good intentions. The intention was good. There's no question mark on the intention. And rarely there is. 
It's just the question mark on the behaviour. How do you know that that behaviour is adding to? Is it impacting in a way that's adding to what you want to achieve? Because no one's judging the mission statement, no one's judging the rhetoric, they're judging what you do every day. Which is why anything to do with your key engagement with your staff has to come from the senior leaders, not from the HR team, not from the OD team. It needs to ooze out of us as the senior leaders of the group so that your HR team will actually have some job fulfilment, so that they will feel rewarded, recognised, that they will get some work-life balance. They'll have a good story at the Saturday night barbecue conversation. So person A, you've got a 30 second snapshot. What's your little nudge for you? Maybe it's a nudge that you will practise at home before you practise it at work. Because who would agree that generally you're already better behaved at work than you are at home? Has anyone picked up that clue? <laughs> so 30 seconds for you, person A. Where's your nudge? Go. Thank you. Now, what's the good bit? What do I love when I get to do this in-house with companies, of course, is that people know each other. And when you get to this bit, a lot of people go on, I'm glad he was here for that because he really needed to hear that message. <laughs> I'm glad she's here because, you know, I'm fine, but everyone else needs to lift their game just a little bit. Please say goodbye to your partner. Come back and grab a seat. Thank you. <laughs> You're a good man. Let me just finish and then Francis has to send you off on your way. One of the stories we talk about with our staff, what's the Saturday night barbecue conversation? Really hard to measure. There's no real model that you can go, hey, how do you talk about the company at the Saturday Night Barbecue Conversation? How do you talk about where you work? How do you talk about the boss? How's work? Yeah, pretty good. What's the boss like? Awesome. Could agree that's an ultimate KPI because the alternative we all know. So how do we tell the story with our staff that reflects the first two agreements in terms of humour and gratefulness, adding to, not taking away? I want you to imagine two kids. One kid, seven, no fault of his own, has just grown up with whinging, moaning, complaining, criticism. One other kid, no fault of his own, has grown up with hate, hopeful, problem solving, curiosity, gratefulness, humour. And we do a social experiment. We get the first kid, put him in a room up to his knees with every toy you could possibly imagine that might shine some light into a seven-year-old world. We get the other kid and we put him in a room up to his knees in horse manure and we'll see how outcomes focused he can be after one hour. We come back to the first kid, he's there completely disengaged. How'd you go, mate? I've seen all these toys, all of them. Well, I haven't seen all of them. And how, how could I see all of them in one hour? That was supposed to be one hour. That was one hour and 10 minutes. If my dad has to park the car and come in here, he's not going to be very happy. Anyone ever been the grown up version of this? <laughs> and when I said to Kevin, and it was the thing that stuck out to him, how many times has your son sat in the back seat of the car for the first seven years of his life and listened to you, to use Seligman's term, explain how life is meant to be? Do you explain life in your company in terms of criticism, whinging, cranky pants? Is that how you explain how things are or do you explain it a little differently? We get in, this other kid is covered in manure, picking up handfuls of poo, flicking it at the ceiling, kicking it out of the way. We think maybe we pushed him too far. This is after one hour. Talk about engaged. He is sweating like a pig. There was poo all over the ceilings, all over the walls, picking up handfuls of poo, flicking it out of the way, going crazy. We think we better stop this. So we wade over through the pool, we tap him on the shoulder, we go, mate, what are you doing? He goes, I'll tell you, with this much horse manure in here, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere, pal. <laughs> Thanks for staying for the last session. It's been a pleasure to serve you and I'll see you around. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you.